John, uh, John chapter 8, beginning verse uh, 1. Uh, I, I, that's a little different from what's printed in your bulletin because I think I had a dyslexic moment when I gave that to Christine. But it's uh, John chapter 8, beginning in verse uh, 1, not John chapter 1. This morning, uh, we're going to make a re a uh, argument, a case for biblical optimism and optimism. Uh, uh, I want to uh, uh, point your attention to John chapter 8, a passage that is familiar to any of us who've been in church for any length of time, the account of the woman caught in adultery. John chapter 8, verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted in their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy, inspired, and inerrant word. We thank you for the truths that you speak to us. We thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that this morning your word would encourage us, and that you would give us a sense of hope and optimism. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. Uh, I am a Thanksgiving kind of guy. I love Thanksgiving. Some people want to jump straight from, from Halloween straight into Christmas, but I love Thanksgiving, and not just because I'm a glutton for turkey. I love Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving is an optimist's kind of holiday. Thanksgiving is a day when we look at the glass and say that our glass is half full rather than being half empty. It's a day when we count our blessings and recognize all the things that God has done for us, when we focus on the good things in our lives and not the negative things. Are you an optimist? Are you an optimist or, or a pessimist? Uh, when you look at the glass, is it half full or is it half empty? When you face trials and problems in your life, do you face them with hope or with despair? There's a big difference between being an optimist and a pessimist. Somebody put it this way, between the optimist and the pessimist, the difference is in the soul. The optimist sees the donut, the pessimist sees the hole. How about you? <laughs> it's been said that an optimist is a person who sees an opportunity in every calamity, and a pessimist is somebody who sees the calamity in every opportunity. Uh, the optimist is the person who believes that this world is the best of all possible worlds. The pessimist is afraid that the optimist may be right. The optimist is a person who walks into a restaurant without any money, hoping that he'll be able to pay for his dinner with the pearl he's going to find in the oysters he's about to buy. Uh, the optimist is a person uh, who, is, uh, who uh, sees uh, everything in the most positive light. An optimist is a person, it was an optimist who invented the airplane, it was a pessimist who invented the parachute. There, there are optimists and pessimists all around us. Mark Twain said, there's nothing sadder in this life than a young pessimist. Now, quite frankly, folks, uh, as we look around the world, we see a lot of pessimists. I think there's a shortage of optimists in our world today. And this morning, I want to make a, 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 case, a case for a well-reasoned biblical optimism. And that Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, we should be optimistic when we look around us. Now, I realize there's a such thing as looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. And, and I'm certainly not advocating for for positive thinking kind of theology. I mean, I'm not Norman Vincent Peale. I'm not saying that that uh, everything in the world is all sunlight and roses. Uh, what I am saying is that there's a, such a thing as a biblical view of life, and it is a view that we can call realistic 
optimism. Realistic optimism. A biblical view of life is founded on the truth that we live in a fallen world. We recognize that not everything is perfect around us, that bad things happen even to relatively good people. Biblical Optimism, realistic optimism, recognizes that, that the world is very imperfect and sometimes people struggle, good people die, children are abused, elderly people are neglected, uh, lawyers take bribes, doctors make mistakes, judges are biased, sometimes Evansville beats Kentucky, bad things happen. Is it, was that too soon for y'all? Bad things happen all around us, apparently for no good reason. But biblical optimism begins by understanding that Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because we are sinners living in a fallen world, sin has infected every area of life, and we ought not be surprised when everything doesn't go right. But praise God, that is not the end of the story. Praise the Lord that the Bible does not end in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and they are cursed and the creation is cursed. That is not the end of the story. Praise God the Bible also contains Romans 8, 28 that tells us that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. How terrible would it be if we did not have the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ that works in us and around us and even in the midst of terrible tragedies to bring about a higher good. Now sometimes the good can be seen quickly and easily. We look around us and, and, and there are good things. Sometimes it takes years, even decades, to see the good that God is going to bring even out of tragedy. And sometimes, quite frankly, we will never recognize why God has allowed something to happen. We will never see the good this side of heaven. But one thing is clear, God is at work in all the circumstances of our lives, both good and bad, positive and ne negative, happy and sad. He is always there patiently working behind the scenes for His ultimate glory and for our good. And because this is true, folks, we have a solid biblical foundation for a Christian optimism. There is a such thing as Christian hope, a hope that is founded on the very character of our God. Folks, you may live to regret a lot of things, but you will never live to regret trusting in our God and His character. There's a theological case, a biblical case, for Christian optimism. And it's not based in positive thinking. It's not based in the character of human beings. I hear people say from time to time, well, you know, most people are good. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that at our hearts we are desperately wicked. But folks, our hope, our optimism is based in the character and the heart of our God who loves us and has loved us so much that He sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. Folks, biblical optimism is rooted in the first spiritual law. Some of you may, have, may be familiar with Campus Crusade for Christ. They call it crew these days, I think. And, and they've always used a little track called the Four Spiritual Laws. And the very first spiritual law is God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. God loves you and He has a plan and a purpose for you and for your life. And if you will just put your trust in Jesus Christ and the fact that He died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins and repent of your sin, God says, I have a wonderful plan to use you and do great things in you and through you. And there's not a better uh, uh, illustration of that anywhere than in John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, it is the Feast of Tabernacles. 
The Jews had all gathered in Jerusalem for uh, an eight-day festival in which they lived in tabernacles, little booths that they built outdoors. They lived outdoors in these booths for eight days. And it was meant to remember the time that they wandered in the wilderness when their people came out of Egypt. And so they've spent this eight days in the tabernacles, in their little tabernacles that they have built, their little booths that they've built. <clears throat> And it's the last day, the very end of the festival, and many people are going up to the temple on that last day, one last visit to the temple before they go back to their homes uh, all across the, the known world. And so they, they gather up at the temple. Now the Bible says that it is, it is early, it's dawn, uh, the, it's that dusky gray time of the day when the sun is just about to peak over the horizon. And they're gathering there at the tabernacle. And the Bible says that there's a man, or excuse me, at the temple. There, the Bible says there's a man at the temple. He's a very controversial figure. He's a rabbi and a teacher. People have said that he has done miracles, and his teaching is compelling. And he's gathered there in the temple, and he's gathered probably, the Bible says, in the courts, probably in the, the court of the women. And he's gathered there and he's begun to teach people. And people are gathering all around him. Hear the words this man is saying. It's incredible the things that he teaches. He teaches with authority and power. And they're amazed at the things that he says. And he's gathered there and he's teaching these people. Early morning, it's, it's dawn. And they're, they're listening to him teach. And all of a sudden, in the midst of this time of teaching, a group of men, a group of religious leaders who are very self-important, I mean, you have to be awfully self-important to interrupt Jesus while he's teaching, they come pushing into the crowd, and they're dragging a woman with them. She's disheveled, and she looks terrified, and they're dragging her into this mist. And they come into to the, the crowd where everybody is, and they stand this woman right in front of Jesus, in front of the whole crowd, literally in front of the whole nation, and they declare to Jesus that this woman has been caught in adultery, in the very act of adultery. And they look at Jesus and they ask him, what should we do with her? What do you think we ought to do with her, Jesus? Now, you have to understand the importance of the charge that's being leveled here. In our day and time, uh, we, we hardly give a second thought to adultery these days, but in that day and time, the law of Moses said that someone who was caught in adultery was to be stoned to death. This is a death penalty. This is, this is a very, very serious situation. Now, honestly, in that day and time, very few people ever got stoned for adultery. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, adultery was something that happened in secret. I mean, first of all, you didn't catch people in adultery very often. And, and Jewish law required you have to, have to have two witnesses, and usually the only witnesses were the people involved, and they aren't talking. So this really rarely happened that someone was stoned, all right? So it brings a, raises a couple of questions here. First of all, how did they catch the woman? The other question is, where is the man that she was having adultery with? I mean, we are, are we really to believe that they caught her, but he got away? Probably not. All, what all this tells me is this is a setup. Okay? This woman was set up, and she was trapped. And she was trapped just not just because they wanted to accuse somebody of adultery. They trapped her because they wanted to trap Jesus as well. And they drag her before Jesus and they ask him, what should we do with her for one reason and one reason only? They want Jesus to trap himself by making a judgment here. Because no matter what he does, they think he's going to be in trouble. You see, the, the Romans had a law. And the law said that you cannot pass death, uh, death sentence on somebody. You cannot put somebody to death. Capital punishment was illegal for anybody except a Roman governor. So if Jesus says, yes, law of Moses says stoner, you go stoner, first thing they're going to do is go to the Romans and say, listen, this Jesus is inciting riots. He's inciting people to, to murder folks. He's, he's seizing the power of Rome for himself. You need to deal with this Jesus. Folks, that's why when the, the Sanhedrin tried Jesus, that's why they didn't kill him themselves. They took Jesus to Pilate because only Pilate could crucify him. So what they're trying to do is get Jesus to get crossways with the Romans so they will take care of him. 
Well, what if Jesus doesn't stand with the law of Moses? What if he says, oh, well, uh, we're going to pass some sentence other than what the law of Moses says, something short of death? Well, then he's in trouble too because the, the religious leaders can stand up and say, well, look, look what Jesus has done. He's violated the law of Moses. He's transgressed the scripture. Certainly he can't be the Messiah. And the people will turn on him. So they've got him caught between a rock and a hard place. What's he going to do? The Bible says, he bent down and began to ride on the ground as if he did not hear them. Now, there have been a lot of people discussing what it was he was writing. Uh, there has been so much ink spilt over this. Uh, whole books are written over what Jesus wrote on the ground while he's doing this. Okay? Some people say that he wrote the name of the man that was caught in adultery with her. Some people say he was writing down the sins of all the religious leaders that were, were there. Some people say that he was, uh, he was uh, uh, writing down, uh, he was writing a new law because God himself wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger and so Jesus is writing down the law of grace. But it doesn't say. I think if it was really important, John would have told us. The point is that Jesus took his time to make the judgment. Personally, I think Jesus is in prayer as he's doing this. Perhaps he's writing a prayer, asking for the guidance of the Spirit. But after a moment, Jesus stops, and he looks these religious leaders in the eye, and he says something that is echoed through 20 centuries. He says, He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And the religious leaders are gobsmacked. They are stunned. He has actually gotten out of their trap. Because as they stand there, they start thinking, well, I'm not without sin, especially the older ones. You know, the, the older ones are, are a little bit more circumspect. They have the, the benefit of years of wisdom. Uh, they know they're not righteous. And so the Bible says that, you know, if they're holding a stone, they drop it and they turn around and slip out. Well, I'm out. They walk away one by one. The younger ones are standing there thinking, well, am I, am I going to say I'm more righteous than dad is or granddad? I, I can't do that either. They drop their stones. They walk away. Meanwhile, Jesus goes to writing again. He gives them enough time to work on this thing and realize just how far short they have come of the glory of God. And then he looks around. They're all gone. And he looks at this woman. And he says something that is, uh, that is absolutely stunning. He says to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she says, No one, Lord. No one has condemned me. The only one left that can condemn her, because he is the only one who is without sin, is Jesus. And Jesus says, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, it's at this point that a lot of people get this completely wrong. We were talking on Wednesday night about the fact that the, the favorite Bible verse of lost people everywhere is from uh, Matthew, Jesus says, uh, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you measure, you will be measured. And they'll, they'll say, judge not that you be not judged. The Bible says, judge not, right? Don't judge. There's even a politician I read about who, there was a big scandal in Washington, and this politician stands up and he says, well, I, uh, I choose not to judge this person because I stand in the tradition of Jesus, who never judged anybody or any sin. Folks, Jesus does judge the sin here. He says, go and what? Sin no more, right? He says what you've done is sin. He condemns what she has done. All he does is he refuses to condemn her. He says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer you forgiveness. I'm going to forgive your sin conditioned on your repentance. Go and sin no more. Folks, the Bible says that if we will receive the, the gift 
of, of salvation from Jesus Christ, believing that He died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, we can have heaven and eternal life because God will forgive us. What we tend to leave out is the fact that God also calls on us to repent of our sin, to turn and go in a different direction. He demands that our lives change. Forgiveness is conditioned on repentance. And that's what Jesus is saying to this woman. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Sin no more. I saw a fellow with a tattoo the other day. The tattoo said, only God can judge me. And I thought, well, that ought to scare you to death. Because God can judge you. God can judge you. But if we will repent of our sins and believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for those sins, we will have heaven and eternal life. He will choose not to condemn us. It's dawn. It's dawn. And I just believe that as this woman turns and goes to leave the temple, at that moment the sun breaks the horizon and the beams of that sunlight pour into the courts of the temple and she is bathed in the light of the sun. And what a beautiful picture of what redemption is. She is drugged to Jesus in the darkness and she goes out in the light. Folks, when we come to know Christ as our Savior, we are changed, we are transformed like this woman. She walks in a sinner and she walks out clean. She walks in guilty. She walks out forgiven. She walks, out, walks in in darkness. She walks out in the light of Christ's love. Folks, Christ can do that with you as well. He can take a life that is bent and make it straight. He can take a life that is broken and make it whole again. He can take an outcast and make that person accept he can take a tax collector who is despised and make him an apostle and a saint. He can take a woman who is living with a man out of wedlock and make her an evangelist for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He can take a demoniac who is inhabited, been possessed by demons and turn him into an evangelist for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel does. He takes our dirty clothes of our old life and he exchanges them for new ones and he makes us righteous in the eyes of the Father. That's what God does. That's why we are optimistic. I heard an illustration this week as I was working on this, uh, on this uh, message. In this illustration, it talks about the fact that little children love to play dress up. When my kids were little, they, they used to play dress up. We had a whole uh, box that was just dress up clothes. And, and the kids, they love, the girls, they loved to put on uh, uh, high heels and try on uh, scarves and hats. And they just loved to, to try on different clothes. It was just love to play dress up. Kids love to do that. You know, emotionally, we do the same thing. We like to try on different personalities, different identities. As we're growing up, we'll try on different kinds of identities. We'll, we'll try on the identity of, of cute and funny. And then we'll take that off and try on the identity of goof off, or class clown, or good student, or angry young man, or rebel, or prom queen, or rule breaker, or party girl. We'll try these on for a while and then we'll take them off and try on another identity. The problem is that for many of us, the personality we tried on many years ago wouldn't come off. The zipper got stuck and we, we couldn't get out. And now it's been 10, 20, 30 years. And that identity doesn't fit us anymore. We're walking around in a coat that says troublemaker or stoner or, or angry young man or critical person or compulsive or promiscuous. We don't know how to change it anymore. I remember my kids from time to time, they put on something, they'd try to zip it up, and they'd get the zipper crossways. You know, it's easy to do, to get caught so it won't come loose. And they come to me and they say, Daddy, fix, fix my zipper. And the first thing I tell them to do is, well, take your hands off the zipper and let me do it. And I'd work with it a little bit, and finally I'd get it to back off, and we'd take it off. 
And Christ says that's exactly what He'll do for us. We can come to Him with that old identity that doesn't fit anymore, that isn't comfortable anymore, that's causing us pain now. And He says, I will take that off and I will change your wardrobe. I will take off the clothes of your old life and exchange them for new ones and I will make you more beautiful than you've ever been before. That's the power of Jesus Christ. He takes the rags of our old life and He replaces them with something brand new. And that's why we're optimists as believers in Jesus Christ because we know that change is possible. It doesn't matter what kind of life you've been leading. It doesn't matter how dark your sin or how deep your hole. Change is possible. You can be totally transformed. Whatever situation or circumstance you find yourself in, it can be totally transformed by Christ. You can walk in today with an old life and walk out this afternoon with a new one. That's why I'm excited about the future. That's why I'm, I'm an optimist because I know change is possible. You may be in a situation in your life you think cannot be changed. A financial situation that, that you feel like is too desperate that can't be changed. It's not too much for God. You may be in a situation of marriage that, that's in trouble and you, you can't find any way out. God says, I can change that. You may be in a situation where you've lost a job or your health is broken or you've lost a dream. God comes to you knowing that you can't find any encouragement or any hope in yourself or in the world or in the circumstances. And He says, it doesn't matter. I can change everything. The promises of the gospel, the promises of the gospel give us hope even when our circumstances don't. Biblical optimism is possible because God's work in your life is a process that He's working through. In Romans 8, 28, he says, all things work together for good for those that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. What God is doing is He is chipping away at everything in your life that doesn't look like Jesus. He's making you into the image of Christ. And He's using every circumstance and every situation in your life, even the ones that are hurtful, even the ones that, that uh, are uncomfortable for you, He is doing that for a purpose and a reason to make you like His Son. And folks, nothing in your life is wasted. No experience in your life is wasted. And it's not meant to destroy you. God has a purpose in everything in your life. And He is working in your life, especially in the hard times, to bring about good. To bring about good. Biblical optimism is possible because God's promises extend beyond this life as well. You, here's the problem with the power of positive thinking. The power of positive thinking comes to an end at the grave. In the end, we all face death. But God's providence, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of the Almighty does not end at death. We know that as believers in Jesus Christ, even when we face death, that the best is yet to come. There's a very old illustration. Most of you have probably heard it about a woman who was very elderly and she was trying to make her own uh, arrangements for her funeral. And she goes, she's talking to the pastor and she says, now, after they lay me out after my, at my funeral, he, she says, I want you to make sure that they put a fork in my right hand. And he says, well, why do you want that? And she said, well, every time we have a church dinner or a potluck, they always tell us, save your fork. And the reason is, the best part of the meal is about to come at the end. Even after the, you finish up with whatever the main course is, as good as it is or as bad as it is, the best part is at the end when they bring out the chocolate cake and the apple pie and the, the, che the cheesecake. The best part is still to come. She said, I want you to put a fork in my hand so when people come by and say, what's with the fork? You want, I want you to tell them because for her the best part is still to come. 
as believers in Jesus Christ, we know that even after death, the best is yet to come. Let me ask you a question. Are you excited about the future? Because if you are a child of God, you ought to be excited about the future you have with Jesus Christ. Because Christ has already taken care of the past and your present and your future. He took care of the past by forgiving your sins and dying on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. He's taking care of your present right now because He has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And He has taken care of your future because He said in John 14, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be be also. If you're a child of God, you are in good hands. Your past is forgiven. Your present is secure. And your future is guaranteed. For the child of God, the best is yet to come. The only question is left is this. Do you know Him as your Lord and Savior? Do you know Jesus Christ? Where is your hope for the future. The Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, but the wages of sin is death, and the wages of sin is death, separation for eternity in a place called hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, whosoever believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, I'm going to invite you in just a moment. We're going to sing a hymn. I'm going to invite you to step in the aisle, come to the front and say, Pastor, I've heard this message of the gospel and I believe. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. What I need to do next? And I'll show you what your next step as a believer in Jesus Christ needs to be. Maybe you're here this morning, you know Christ is your personal Savior, but you need a church home, a place where people care about you and love you, a place where you can be taught the Word of God. I can't think of a better place to do that than Younger's Creek Baptist Church. I'm going to invite you to step in the aisle, come to the front and say, Pastor, I want to bring our family to be a part of your family here at Younger's Creek, and we'll receive you as a Baptist Church receives members this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you know Christ is your personal Savior, but you've been a pessimist. You've forgotten all the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. During this time of invitation, this is a good time to change your orientation. Recognize the hope that we have in Jesus Christ and to give thanks during this Thanksgiving week for what God has done for you in the past, the present, and will do for you in the future. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us and care about us. We thank you that you have given us heaven and eternal life if we believe in you. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us so many good and perfect gifts. Lord, we ask that you would move in the midst of this congregation, that you would encourage us and that edify us, and Lord, that for any that might not know Christ as their Savior, Lord, that you would move upon that heart and that you would help them to see their need for a Savior, that they would flee to salvation this very morning. For the rest of us, Lord, we ask that you remind us of all the gifts that we have in Christ, the fact that change is possible, and the fact that, Lord, that you are almighty and all-powerful, and as long as you are on the throne, that we are never without hope. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray these things, to your glory and praise and honor. Amen. Let's stand for our hymn of invitation.